I'm the music guy, TJ Plain, and this is the Noise Report. As you see, we have a fancy new shine that uh, I got at the dollar store, and uh, I couldn't resist spending the two bucks for it. So, <laughs> um, you know what we do here? We laugh, we have fun, we interview cool and interesting people, or pretty much anyone I can con into coming on this thing. And today, again, another bucket list interview, man. Like, you know, there are, as I've stated before, there are those select few people who I look up to for various reasons, either as musicians, as producers, or in this gentleman's case, a little bit of everything. <laughs> um, you guys know that I am currently... uh enrolled in classes to learn to do music production and to be a producer myself. And uh, there are three people in the production end of music that I have always sort of looked up to and idolized for the music that they've done. This is one of the gentlemen right here, uh, along with Rick Rubin and Jim Steinman. Um, oh my god! Am I in the top three? With you are guy? in the you oh are in the top god. three. Oh um, my god! I'm, that's that's an honor. This is Mr. Alessandro Del Vecchio. Am I saying that right? Is it Del Vecchio? Yeah, it's perfect. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he's coming to us all the way from Italy, man. So, um, we're gonna talk about his massive uh, career because this guy has done well. If you're a hard rock fan or you're a rock fan, he's done just about everything. So we're going to touch on a little bit of it because um, we'd be here for a week if we tried to talk about everything. So um, I'll let him start by introducing himself and uh, giving you a little background on him. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Alessandro Del Vecchio, and I'm uh, an artist, a producer, some writer, and uh, as, a, as a musician, I always uh, define myself as a keyboard player that sings and a singer that plays keyboards because keyboards are my main instrument and it's the instrument where, you know, on, on which I'm, I'm more confident, but I also play bass, guitar and drums. And uh, occasionally uh, some artists like what I do on those instruments and I end up being the bass player of George Lynch or, or, or the guitarist of Michael Sweet and uh and things like that uh which i love to do because i've been raised on uh you know on a very musical family my parents don't play any instrument but they they they're music lovers i mean my mom she's uh 72 next year she still sings every day every minute nice. uh she's from naples from the south of italy where singing is uh, a sort of religion and it's something that when you do it, you do it with passion. And my mom is not a professional singer, but she sings everything with passion. So I've been raised with my mom singing, my dad as a big Genesis uh, and Jethro Tull fan. Hi. And uh, so when I was five, my my favorite band was Genesis. And my most favorite record was Selling England by the Pound, which basically defined the musician I am. And uh, that's why I love, you know, big arrangements and uh, not usual chord structures. And uh, I've uh, produced around, I don't have the, the exact number, but I guess it's around 150 records or something like that. At least. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, lots of records and uh, have, I've had the honor to, to, literally uh you know uh make a checklist of all of my heroes and i've been uh, making music with them at uh different levels and and degrees but uh going from uh producing mr big to uh working with uh, journey uh and uh you know having bands with uh, dean castronovo uh doug aldridge and jack blades and you know many many other things and hardline and uh, Michael Sweet, George Lynch, uh, Brett Gillis. I mean, there the, the list is literally. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, oh my! I mean, when I look back, I'm like, oh my god! All these, all these guys that I was listening when I was fourteen and fifteen are all on my on my CV now. And uh, yeah, it's a 
I've I've been very very uh, fortunate and I'm grateful that I can do this at this level and uh, you know even after uh, being a professional musician for almost thirty years, I still get requests that are you know giving me chills you know oh my oh my God I'm doing this with this guy and uh and uh and I go back in memory lane when I was listening to those records from these guys and uh and it's pretty amazing. I have to say that I that I've had a, an amazing career from uh you know for, from being a guy from the countryside of Italy and uh you know and and going against everybody who was uh not trying to bash me down they were trying to keep me real and they were like <laughs> I mean what they don't need an Italian guy you know, teaching them how to do it and produce them and tell them how things should be done. Uh, but, you know, I was, uh, perseverance is, is one of the keys of my personality. And uh, I I was like, okay, if I have to make music, I want to make music, the music that I love and I want to be uh, on the creative side. I want, to, I want to write songs. I want to perform the songs that I play, that, that I write. And I don't want to just play covers or uh, nothing against any professional mu musician right. doing covers. I just wanted to do something else. And uh, and uh, I was, you know, just persistent and uh, worked hard. And uh, here we are today. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that on so many levels because growing up, I grew up on a 400-acre farm with a dad who was a truck driver. So... I grew up in the front seat of a semi truck and in the early seventies, when that was going on, you know, as I've told people, there were no computers, no cell phones, none of that stuff. I had books and I had music. So I was constantly surrounded by music in the truck. My dad is probably the world's biggest Bob Seger fan. Like oh, my, wow. my okay. dad will physically fight you over Bob Seger. Like if you say something bad about Bob Seger, my dad will physically fight you over it. Like he's just religious about Bob Seger. Um, but when I had to actually go to school, I stayed at my grandpa's house cause he was gone over the road and I got, you know, country music. And then my cousins listened to punk and I got Motown and all of these different musical influences um, so I've sort of become this fan of music in the sense that I have all of these crazy ideas to do this and why I waited till I was almost 50 to go to school to be a producer. I've been doing it for 30 years in some form or another, whether it's internet radio or whether it's in my own bands or whether it's working with friends locally or whatever, but I've never thought to actually get the proper training so I could get paid for it. So after my divorce about a year and a half ago, I decided, you know, maybe I should get a degree in this so I can actually fucking get paid for this, you know, like <laughs> instead of just yeah, doing right. it right move at about the right time, because, you know, out of a, uh... Out of, uh, you know, I always say that, you know, you need pain and you need, uh, you need suffering and you need, you know, you need rock, hidden rock bottom in life right. because that gives you a, like a boom reality check. Now got to change something because everything that I've done, the equation, the sum of everything that I've done up to this point didn't work out. So I have to change something, get a new challenge get new blood in my life. And um, ha I'm happy you're doing this because there's no, there's no, at least in my opinion, there's no, uh, no other job can give you so much, uh, uh, I don't know, e emotion and drive than right. supporting an artist. Because when you're in the studio producing someone, you're basically, you're basically in charge and responsible of what the record is going to sound like, be mm -hmm. like uh, the song structure and everything, but you're part, you're, you're an essential part of what people then are going to hear because the sound is going to be the dress of the songs and the band. And, uh, you know, and uh, since I was a, a kid, I, I was always checking the credits and I was like, hmm, 
okay, there are there are common people working on the records. Like the first one that I literally adored was uh, Martin Birch because he could do Iron Maiden, Rainbow, uh, Deep Purple, and, and this and that and make them sound unique. And same thing for Bruce Fairbairn or 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 Te yeah. Temple Man. I was like, you know, I was in awe because they they had a sound of their own in the terms of Clue, but they they were making the band sound even more personal. And that's always been my my taste as a producer. It's always been like, okay, you got I I you know you want me to produce you, but it's not going to be that I'm, I'm going to impose my personality because I have my bands for that. I'm going to give you, you know, my, my, you know, gl the glue of how I make the instruments sound together. But it, you know, we have, our, our aim is to find your sound and there's, there's nothing as rewarding as that. When the record is done, you, you, you play the master, you check the master and you, hear something that at the beginning was just an idea and then it became like a like a real thing untangible but real in your face yeah i've rick rubin is one of the people to me like when i first heard of rick rubin the reason i've always idol or not i don't want to say idolized but the reason i've always looked up to rick because rick is so diverse you know, he goes from Public Enemy to the Beastie Boys to Johnny Cash to yeah, Slayer, and, you know, and and that, Adele. I mean, he goes, and that's that's what I want to do as a producer. Like, I get, I, I I keep being told, well, you need to, as a producer, you need to focus on something and and find your niche. And I was like, I don't want to be that guy. I want to be that guy that when you walk into my studio, I don't care what you bring to me, whether it's reggae, whether it's punk, whether it's hip hop, whether it's metal. I want to be able to make you sound like you paid me a million dollars to yeah. get that sound, you know, and I get that I can't be all things to all people, but I don't want to be that guy that only does hip hop or only does metal or only does whatever. And, and that's cool for people that do that. Like, Hey, awesome. You know, I, I've got no issue with that. Um, but my musical tastes are so diverse that I want that to come into play. I want to be able to work with people like blue October. I want to work with people like Michael sweet. I want to work with people like Romaine Virgo, who is a reggae artist from the Caribbean. You know, I want to be able to work with, uh, there's so many people that I love and adore as musicians and they're all across the musical spectrum. So I want to be able to work with them and, you know, <laughs> collaborate with them. And that's kind of what my goal of this is. And one of the things I love about you is, you know, even though, the majority of what you do is sort of within the rock and hard rock genre. It's still really diverse. I mean, it's some of it is just straight hard rock and some of it is, you know, more prog oriented. And some of it is very, I like to almost compare it to Jim Steinman in the sense that it's that big bombastic type of sound that almost bad out of hell type of sound uh, on the yeah. production end. Yeah, because, you know, and, you know, I, I thank you for saying that it's diverse. Sometimes I feel trapped in rock, <laughs> which I love, but it's, you I know, sometimes, it. you know, it's a, it's a little, uh, I feel a little in a box with, with rock, but mm -hmm. I'm grateful that I've, you know, in my life I've done from dance to pop and to death metal to anything you know i'm i'm fortunately unfortunately what paid the bills the most was rock because i think it's uh you know what 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 made me work with these guys is the fact that i have no no boundary you know even when i approach a rock record i don't have you know like oh the drums have to sound like that you know i right. i try to, to i try to give an identity to every record 
it's the toughest job when you're doing like, you know, 20 records a year, you know, between mix and production and sometimes even 30 or more. Mm. That is tough because you have to, uh, you know, from one day to another, you have to wear uh, a different hat. Uh, but, but, you know, but, but, you know, to me, that's how, that's what a producer should do. You know, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think production is just sound, you know, some of the people just focus on the, the, the sonics, but to me, production is how you dress a song. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I don't think there's a rock formula on how rock should sound or pop or this or that, because then you, you, uh, turn on the radio and all the rules you think you you have, have have been broken because you can get you know uh freaking Demi Lovato doing a punk record uh straight out of a punk a pop record and then you have uh you know uh, I don't know uh bands like you know um uh, Bruno Mars or Taylor Swift or Carrie Underwood that are more rock than than most of the rock bands <laughs> and they don't use they don't use the rock formula they don't use the 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 right. you know the bonzo drums or the bombastic this and that they chase music differently but still make it uh rock in my opinion yeah. and uh or you know metal you know you, you it's it's so there's so much variety because if you yeah if you get the Terry Date uh, Slayer sounds and the European metal, they're, they're so different. Mm -hmm. That's one side is very clean, it's very precise. On the other side, it's more like the rawness of mm -hmm. delivery. And you know, the, the good thing about rock and metal is that if you want to put the work in, there's so much variety. And you mm -hmm. can make rock record heavier by applying other other uh rules from other genres or you know Def Flapper teaches us uh teaches us all that if you take pop elements and you put it on on a rock on a hard rock record you make the you know one of the best records ever made like hysteria or right. you know the examples of contamination are so are so many even today I mean like a band like Muse it could be yeah. a metal it could be a prog metal band in our world, but they were able to use pop elements to get out of uh, of the of of you know of that corner that sometimes niches create. You know that's why I don't like when they say, you know, at the beginning they were like, "Oh, Ali is a metal producer," and I was like, "I'm not even. I'm I'm, I'm a blues guy. You know, from from scratch. I'm you know I have a Hammond organ in my studio. That's my favorite instrument. Um." You know, and I just produce whatever, you know, literally whatever has to be done. And if I need to do the work in learning some techniques or or getting, uh, you know, deep diving into a genre that I'm not aware of, I'll, I'll do the job because, you know, it's like a director. You know, I don't think, you know, the greatest directors would go like by genres, you know, they just go right. by movies. You know, and uh, and you can be, you know, or I mean, if you're if you're if you're uh, fortunate and and lucky and you want to have a trademark, that's just that. I just want to be a a, a trap producer. That's fantastic if you like right. it. But to me, it's a it's a it's a cage, and uh, and it doesn't make things exciting for me. You know, I need right. a challenge. You know, I need even in me when I mix a record, I'm always like. You know, I don't start, I don't even ask the genre. I just go like, okay, send me the stuff. I just, you know, put everything into into the, 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 the software, just push play. And I just listen to whatever the song is, you know, in its raw nature. And I just refine what I get, uh, you know, unless the band has, you know, oh, we would like to have, sometimes it happens. We would like to have the hardline drum sound. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay, if you want, I mean, I know that I I created that. I mean, right. for six records, whatever. But uh, okay, but you know, to me, it's always like I just play the drums and I play vocals, and I just hear what's on the song, and that defines what the song needs. Right. And it's, you know, one of the I love Japanese artists because of all of the places 
where there's music. Japan, to me, is the one place where the genres really just sort of completely Mapped together. together. Yeah. Um, you have bands like X Japan that have mixed classical and rock and in that you have bands like Crossface that have taken EDM music and mixed it with, you know, metalcore. You have bands like um baby metal, even though I, I really am not a baby metal fan. You know, they've taken J pop and mixed it with that. Uh, you yeah, have yeah. bands like uh Broken by the Scream who have just turned everything on its head and then you have maximum the hormone which is just the biggest musical clusterfuck for lack of a better word that you've ever heard <laughs> because you know these guys have 367 time changes within a single song and just it, it's they just throw everything in a song and when you listen to maximum's music you kind of hit the end of the song and you're just sort of like what did I just listen to, man? Like, that shouldn't work. But it's so great. It's like, I like to compare him to Mr. Bungle because yeah, yeah. it's that same sort of thing that Mike Patton does where he just sort of throws it in there and somehow... It works. And it's... Perfect. Your brain says this should not work. But it works. But it does, you know? And it's just like, hey, great, awesome, dude. And I want to be... That's sort of, like I said, that's sort of part of what I want to be. I want to be able to uh, just. You know, the funny thing is that we have the same ponytail today and the same <laughs> haircut. That's crazy. I was like, what? <laughs> I, you know, I had long hair up until I joined the army at 18. And then for 40 years or 30 years, I kept my hair short. My wife, my ex-wife hated long hair. So I just... And now you're going hair. like this! <laughs> and I went through the divorce, and dude, she... She turned it in just to a battle of attrition. Uh, I'm sorry for that. And I was like, okay, look, you want to play war? You know, I, I'm Viking heritage and Aries. Hey, great. I can do war. Like, war is what my family history is so i drug her through the court system and i got sole custody of my son and she lost everything that, that's awesome um, news sorry sorry so, for you but but I mean, it, 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 is what it is but 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 after that i was just like you know what i'm growing my hair and i'm gonna get back into the music because i put it off for so long because growing up you know that you always had teachers what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm going to be a rock star. Oh, well, that's a cute dream. What do you really want to do? Ah, I'm going to yeah. be a rock star. Well, okay. Well, what if that doesn't work out? What's your plan B? Plan B? I'm going to be a rock star. <laughs> there was never a plan B for me. It was always going to be music. And when Michael Monroe come along, you know, I, I, I always drifted through the, all the musical styles. When Michael come along and did the Not Faking It record, when I heard Dead Jail or Rock and Roll, that song was like a lightning bolt to me. Because it was like, he just told my life in a song. Because I always knew from the earliest age that I was either going to be dead in jail or I was going to play rock and roll. There was never any question. It was always going to be one of those three things. And... It's never changed. In I'm, I'm really, I'm really glad that you're, you know, that finally, you know, life sometimes it got turns yeah. and it's strange events, but then you eventually, if your, if your soul is into the right place, right, in the right place, and your dreams are aligned with who you are, then it's gonna work out. I always say that, you know, I hate Plan Bs for one, for one simple reason, because they give you in the back of your head. You know that if you fail, you're gonna have you know a mattress to fall on, and that is safety, and that's gonna make you make safe choices. Right. And uh, again, I mean, uh, yeah, and from 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 a from a guy that doesn't come from 
a, a, a rich family. They give me they give me everything, but we're not you know millionaires. I didn't have the money to to get the proper education back then. I didn't have the money to fly to America and to afford being in America where I could have learned. I could have, I could have learned those things like in <laughs> in, in a right. fraction of time. And uh, but uh, I was always I always said, well, my plan is to be a musician. It's whether a teach music teacher. I don't care. I playing covers, playing ballet music, right? Playing whatever disco clubs. But I'm gonna be a musician, and that's that's how I learned so many things and instruments. And and I've been sort of a jack of all trades because I didn't want to have a plan B. I you know I I remember when I was um, uh, 13 when Freddie Mercury died. I told my dad I want to be like him. I just I want to write songs, play songs to the people, and have them feel the same emotion that I feel when I listen to records. And that's been my every day when I wake up, I'm always constantly reminding myself that I have to be happy in a world that's not easy, but I'll do whatever it takes to make it my happy place. And sometimes, you know, uh, people are like, well, but you could have done this to become famous and this and that, because, you know, with music, when you're a plumber, uh, if you're a plumber and you're an accomplished plumber in your area, that's all it takes to get respected. But if you're a musician and you're respected enough to make a living out of it, it's not enough for people. They're like, oh, right. but but uh, are you famous? <laughs> Would you ask a dentist if they're famous? You know, music is is the same exact uh, work as any other job. It's not different. It's not special. It's not magic. It's a job, unfortunately, at the end. But it's just a job that you're able to make with your passion. But sometimes even those uh, the those social rules make you think with a plan B and you're like, Oh, well, I should get a job and make music on the side. You will never have the time to be as good as if you put like 10, 12, 14, 16 hours a day into that. And right. it's something that I always tell everybody, you know, I've, I've, I, there, there were moments when I was so poor that I couldn't afford anything, but still I was like with my hands on the keyboards, I was playing gigs. I was doing this. I was doing that. I was doing session. I've always been pushing for that. And when it worked at the end, I didn't change ethics because, I, you know, in this business, it's not like you made one record and you're going to last forever. It only happens to one person on, on, on a million, on a million one, you know, over a million. It's not, it doesn't happen to everyone. And, uh, and, and I hate plan B's when they talk like that. I'm like, yeah. no, you're, you're prepared to fail. You're putting, you know, you, you're putting failure in the program and you shouldn't have that because everything can fail. You can fail even in the safest life plan can fail because you could die. You know, right. it's, it's everything is so uncertain that you shouldn't have plan B's. Just go for it like 100 percent. Just, you know, whatever. Raise your middle finger to anybody who's trying to block you and just do whatever makes you happy. And in this day and age, even this morning I was talking to my assistant uh, and I was like, we all should be happy. Yeah. You know, why should we make a job that we don't like for our for, for our entire life? Maybe it worked uh, 50 years ago because maybe... There was less attention and uh, on 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 what what happiness is because the world wasn't so crazy like nowadays. But whatever job you make, it's gonna be tough, and so you better do the job you like and you love. And what if you fail, you just get back on your feet again and you know and just <laughs> do something else. You know yeah. that's what we do in life. You know, until we breathe, we we live and learn. Yeah, like I have an uncle who he is a bass player in Nashville, and he has never he he sort of fell into a gig as a studio musician about thirty years ago, <clears throat> and for thirty years 
he has been a studio musician and he's made a small fortune doing nothing other than playing on other people's country records. And he's been, he's played bass on hundreds of country records that have won Grammys. They've won multiple awards. You know, he's played with Gary Allen, Alan Jackson. He's played with George Strait. He's played with Charlie Daniels. He's recorded with just a laundry list of these people. But he never goes out on tour. He never records his own music. He just, he goes in, he plays what they give him. He gets paid and he goes home. Fantastic. And somebody was like, well, you've never won awards. You've never gotten famous. And my uncle will be like, no, but I've got a 10,000 square foot house with a swimming pool and I get to go home every night. I don't have to be away from my kids or my wife. And I'm, I, I've always thought about that. Like, man, that's fantastic. Yeah. Like, I mean, you're getting paid more than some famous musicians and you never barely have to leave your house. Like you literally just, yeah, you know, like that's a gig that's that so many musicians would kill to have. Like, <laughs> yeah, but you know, but you see people are like, oh, but you're not, oh, but, oh, we're, we're you know, to me, the question is always, oh, but you're always playing, you know, far from here. And I'm like, well, that does it does it change <laughs> you know? yeah like you do what you gotta do for a thousand people maybe not not here but in portugal or 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 anywhere or germany or anywhere but you know it's a you know it's a social pressure on artists you know because right. they like you know sometimes if you know to my wife they're like ah and how can your your husband support a family and she's like, well, he's been doing this for 30 years. And 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 they're like, oh, but uh, but uh is he gonna be able to afford? She's like, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we <laughs> got our house, we 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 we've done everything that normal people do. Right. But 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 you know, but I think it's it's it should be mandatory, you know. When 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 you make music, yeah, you, you have to learn how to make it work. Right. Because because it has to give you uh you know that stability you know I never wanted to be a musician and and be you know desperate and right. uh, and I, you know any music I I'm, I have no ego you know until I can play my music I can also be the sound engineer for a live uh, a live club you know like yep. you know two two miles from my house. It's still music. It's still right. apply, I'm still applying the knowledge of a whole life behind it. And sometimes, you know, I mean, these people are like, oh, but you know, but we never see your husband on TV. And she's like, well, this, that's not his, that's not his thing. Yeah. I mean, is is out in you know Japan playing, and uh, you know, and uh, and they're like, oh, but you know, but it, but it's okay. I I can understand, but but it's the it's the social pressure. On, on artists and uh, it's up to us to change that you know yeah. because they're gonna ask for plan b's if we fail but if we learn on how to make it work and honest how much money do you need you know yeah. you make the plan you make it work you know you can be a teacher you're a music teacher and make a fortune i know i know vocal coaches yeah. that are millionaires you know and, and that's they they don't get in the spotlight, but they still they're still making music. They're working in the music business. And that's me. Like I've I I, I want to do my own music because I've got a set of songs that I've had for 30 years that I've never really recorded. And I've just I've been sitting on them for through all of this stuff and I want to record them and I want to produce people. But I was sitting the other night and I thought, you know what I really want to do? is once I get this degree and once I get experience in the studio and all of that, I want to go back and teach this to some other people. Like I want to perpetuate it forward. And I would love to be like a college instructor and teach, you know, whatever classes it is, whether it's how to use pro tools, how to use audacity, how to mix and master, how to, use social media, whatever it is, the the niche within this 
what we do, I would love to have a teaching position somewhere that I could teach, you know, music production, whether it's in high school or whether it's at the college level or whether it's just tutoring people so that people can learn it. And, you know, like knowledge is so powerful to me that, you know, I just, I, I really kind of want to get to that point where I can teach as well as, you know, sort of record my own stuff when I'm not teaching. But um, we, we've spent the whole interview talking about everything other than uh, your new record, Edge of Forever, the ritual <laughs> record. Um, what an outstanding record, man. Like, Thank you very you've much. always recorded amazing stuff and your vocals have always been so great. But on this record, man, this is just so to me, it's so next level. Like you have upped your your game so much on this record. Like it's so phenomenal. It's so catchy and it's so everything about this record is just flawless to me. Like I I've listened to this record so many times this year and it just gets better and better. And it's one of the, like I said, it's one of the reasons that I, 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 I think so highly of you because you have so much going on and yet you still somehow <laughs> always come up with such amazing stuff, man. And, um, you know, and then you go and you do soul driver with Michael and again it's such a complete catchy record and it's just like I don't understand how you can just continually like write song after song after song and it oh you you and Eric Martinson both like are just I don't think y'all could write a bad song like if you intentionally walked into the studio and said I'm gonna write a bad song on purpose <laughs> I don't think either one of you could do it. Like it just, it's not in your DNA to, to do it. Like Eric is that way. Like Eric is just this song after song. It's like, Jesus, how the hell I, did this guy just I, turn I'm out? so jealous. You know, I'm so jealous of Eric. He's so good. Such a great songwriter, uh, producer, singer. And yeah. yeah, yeah, I really, I really look up to him because, you know, we've been, you know, we came out of the same in the at mm -hmm. the same time, and we were able to, you know, cut our teeth, you know, in the business around the same time. But it's so good, my God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, as a, let me ask this: as a producer, as a musician, what? piece of advice would you give a beginner like what as far as training to be a producer training to be a musician or even as a band getting ready to go into the studio what's something that's important for them to know or do before they come into the studio so that they are ready to do what they do so uh, uh in terms of productions uh and advice to uh young producers i would say just produce experiment record mix as many songs as possible in your spare time uh because there's nothing better and more instructional than getting your hands on a mixer and and mix and work on sounds and find uh you know and find microphone placement that's going to work for the sound that you have in your head and translate it into into some, something that's on tape you know or or on a uh, daw you know whatever but when it's uh when it's uh when you have a sound in your head how can you reach that sound you'll have to study but you have to experience that process you know, thousands of times before you can really master that. And, you know, and uh, I can, I can say that uh, it, it, it works. Uh, you, it's going to be experimental every time because every musician is different, especially mm -hmm. instruments like drums, 
and the drum tuning and everything, but I would say just experiment as much as you can. Put as you know, thousands hours into mixing, you know, but but still work. I mean, like produce your band, your your band friends, you know, your 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 neighbors, your anybody, you know, just mm -hmm. get up level and but learn, but learn on the field. And uh, same for the bands, you know, what one thing that really made a difference for me as a musician to be a producer's friend, you know, in the studio, to be as studio friendly as possible, to come really prepared, but with an arsenal of options and be ready to change everything right. and uh, be ready to improvise and be ready to, you know, forget about being in the center of all decisions because sometimes a producer will make you change things that you won't like and you won't accept if you take it too personal. But uh, if you if you trust the producer, you have to trust uh, that, you know, you're, you're lending your music to him. Right. Like, okay. Now I'm handing my music to you and you're going to do the final thing. And I ha you have to trust him. It's like a, it's like an architect for your house. You know, you're right. not going to, you're not going to try to teach an architect right. how to build the house. You know, you're going to be like, oh, I would like to have a, you know, a round porch, but you, he knows how to do it. And same thing is for, for a producer, but really come, really become competent on being flexible and, being prepared and being an, a nice person in the studio you know what 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 i pride myself with is that uh i rarely i've had bad studio experiences because i've always come mm -hmm. very prepared uh, you know as a producer or as a musician it doesn't matter you know it's the the other way it's always you know goes full circle uh, I've always been like, you know, it has to be a great experience. You, ha you have to have fun. But to do that, you have to do the job, you know, the, put the the work in before mm -hmm. you go to the studio. So always get, get prepared, always be prepared and be competent and be uh, and be ready for change. You know, as I don't know how many times I had to improvise a way out of uh, a musical part because, you know, the producer needed wanted something else i've heard something else and what what i've learned uh i always trust uh trusted producers when they were like we hear something that's different and we know that you can pull it off and i've always taken that as a, as a challenge because i i don't want to be the guy you know that people go like oh we were in the studio and that guy couldn't pull it off right because heroes um uh, like Steve Lukather or Leland Sklar or, you know, so many of these people that I've yeah. worked with in the studio, they're, they're magicians, you know, yeah. you, you can give them any style, any song, and they're going to play it perfectly. And that doesn't mean that you're the best you know, pop guitarist or pop keyboard player, but you're the best in that moment because you have an arsenal of, of solutions. And that's really vital in the music. Yeah, I so many of the people that I've idolized have kind of, I guess, flown under the radar a little bit. Of, um, for me personally, when you said Genesis, uh, that hits home with me because when people talk about the greatest guitar players or their favorite guitar players, you know, you always hear Jimi Hendrix, you always hear Eddie Van Halen, you always hear all of these names. Uh, but me, there's two names that stand out above everybody. That's Gary Moore and Steve Hackett. And those are the two guys that sound-wise, for guitar playing, they I put way up here because Gary, Gary was just ferocious. I actually got to see Gary perform at Castle Donington in 1984. Oh, my God. Uh, I was about seventh row, and it was to this day probably one of the loudest shows I've ever attended. Uh, Gary was in full force. I mean, Gary's just Gary's Gary. Like you know, he just so fluent from going from the technical to the shredding 
to the passionate blues notes and then back. And I've never seen another guitar player that played with the ferocity and the passion that Gary played with. And Steve on the opposite side of the coin plays in such a delicate way that it's hard to describe like Steve plays in a it's such an understated way but it's so beautiful and it's so fluent and it's whether it's his solo stuff or whether it's the Genesis stuff Steve doesn't get nearly enough credit I think yeah, absolutely and you know talking about guitars that play for the songs I mean yeah to me and sometimes people are like you know, they shake their heads when I say that. But to me, the greatest yeah. guitar players are Gary Moore and Neil Sean because their solutions in the songs are so a song within the song mm -hmm. that you don't get it, you know, with other guitarists. And Steve Eckett and, and the, the whole Genesis yeah. uh, lineup, in my opinion, it was, you know, th the other day I was listening to, uh, watching a podcast uh, of Dramio with uh, Nick Collins, the son of mm -hmm. Nick Collins, who's been playing drums with Genesis in the on the last tour, and on the Phil Collins solo show, mm -hmm. and he was explaining all those drum parts, and you know, and you think about Phil Collins and you think about him as a as a singer, right, or songwriter, but drumming wise, I mean, there's nobody like him. Like yeah. he, I mean, that band, Tony Banks, Mike Rutherford. I mean, they were like, oh my god, they were the 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 the. I don't know. They were so unique on their yeah. own, but together they made such a a a unique way of making music. And the, the yeah. you know, the one thing that you know, and to me, that's why Genesis to me was the best prog prog rock uh, band ever, because their parts were so musical that you could whistle. Yeah any any part you know and while i love yes and i love emerson emerson lake and palmer and i love gentle giant but you you know it's music that's tough to listen to you yeah. know but while yeah. genesis you know <laughs> those records they were like so so melodic even when they were like intricate and sometimes even the the odd uh tempo measures you know, they sounded so natural and so fluent that you couldn't, you you didn't even feel that that it was a seven eight or or a, yeah. a crazy a crazy measure. And you know, like a song like I don't know the cinema show. I, you know, I bet anybody, you know, you could whistle the whole song from top to bottom. Yeah. You know, and uh, and still it's a it's it's you know the supper's people. ready is the perfect example. You know. <laughs> 20, yeah, yeah, yeah. 26 minutes long and it's so singable and it's so yeah yeah you know and you instantly recognize maybe not the entire 26 minutes of it but there's parts of that song that as soon as you hum it people know what that is like they just um you know it's and and i, I feel that way about pink floyd like i'm a massive pink floyd fan as well and some of their stuff is so over the top to me that and some of it is very challenging to listen to. Like some of the early stuff is very, you really got to sort of put your mind to it to really get through it. But then some of the stuff is so just there that yeah, it's, it's hard not to love. And me personally, I'm a huge fan of this, the record, the division bell. There's something about I that. Hope record that when you write a song like High Hopes, you're like beyond yeah. question. You know, there's there's yeah. no question that you're the best. Yeah. And to me, it was always the song Dogs of War. The way oh. he sings that, you know, the dogs of war are at your door. And it's just his the timber in his voice along with that, the bluesy notes that he's playing. It's just, it's haunting, you know, yeah. and it's just, People are like, well, you know, that was Pink Floyd after this and this and this. And yeah, I don't care. Like that Simply record, very Pink Floyd. <laughs> yeah, like that record to me is as flawless a record as you could humanly create. Like to me, 
that's just like the top of the mountain to me. Like if I ever could produce something that was anywhere near the division bell, oh I could God. call it a day and just be completely happy. Like I'm, 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 I've reached a mountain and there's nowhere to go, but down from here, you know? Um, so the last thing I want to do with you, uh, I did this with Jeff because it was something new and Jeff was just such a dream interview for me because Jeff, uh, Jeff, who Jeff Scott Soto. <laughs> Jeff Scott Soto yeah, yeah. I, I thought maybe Jeff Pilson. And, no, or... no, uh, <laughs> not Jeff. Uh, no. My brother, um, my brother, Jeff, Jeff Scott Soto. I, I, I started this journey as a podcaster in 2009 and I literally, Jeff was one of the first people I tried to get an interview with. And it took me until about four months ago to finally uh, get it what, a nice, and what a nice guy. It was yeah. such a surreal experience because, like you said in the beginning, 14 and 15-year-old me laying on my bed in a foster home with all of the posters on the wall. You could have never... There's no amount of money you could have given me at 15 years old to convince me that I would be where I am right now and I would get to talk to and interview and collaborate in whatever form with the people that I stared at posters of. And Jeff was one of those guys. The first time I heard that Melmstein record, I was like, this guy's incredible. And I have followed Jeff every step of the way through the biker mice with Mars, through eyes, talisman. Me too. <laughs> you know, and, and Jeff has always been the pinnacle for me as far as singers, other than Freddie, which, you know, Freddie's so far above everybody yeah. that um, it's unfair to compare anyone to Freddie. So Jeff has always been sort of the quote unquote realistic pinnacle <laughs> for me as a singer. Uh, so getting to interview him was like, I can't believe I'm sitting here talking to this guy. So I created a thing for him anyways, long story short. It's called Blurts. And essentially, I'm going to say a name, and you just sort of blurt out the first thought or story or whatever comes to your mind. Okay. So be it good, bad, whatever. Just the first thing that pops to your mind when I say their name. Um. And the first one is Jeff Scott Soto because I, 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 you were the first one I did for Jeff because I knew how much you and Jeff have worked together. So, <laughs> uh, uh, well, the 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 only thing that comes to my mind is how 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 vital my meeting, my casual meeting with Jeff, has been to my career. I met Jeff at a Dio concert in Milan in two thousand and two or one we still don't we're still trying to remember which year it was right and i couldn't believe that jeff Cotsoto was in milan watching a deal show and nobody was talking to him <laughs> i literally got in the car it's the 2000 to uh cedars club so it's 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 big mm -hmm. i walk in there's jeff and marcel there marcel jacob and i'm oh. like and my only thought was like, go get a demo and give it to them. I never did that in my life. Went to the car, got got my demo, give it to them. And I was like, guys, I'm the only one who's talking to you. So you should really trust me for, you know, right. and li please listen to the demo. If you don't like it, let me know. If you like it, here's my email. 15 days uh, later, Marcel writes me and goes like, well, I'd like to produce you guys. That was at you forever. And Jeff would like to sing on the record. I wanted to die right. that day. I was like, I'm going to die. <laughs> I'm not going to survive this. But so Jeff, I really, I really literally owe, owe a lot to Jeff. And I love him as a person. I love making music to him. I would make music with him in any situation. If he calls me for a waltz record right. or anything, I would do it with him. And, and again, one of the reasons I love Jeff Again, going back to that that spirit of Queen. Jeff literally, there's no boundary to what Jeff can do, whether it's funk, whether it's metal, whether it's prog, whether it's rock, That's whether it's true. blues, soul. Like Jeff could just, Jeff could sing names out of a phone book. 
and it would be amazing. Um, next name on the list is Johnny. I'm going to say his name wrong. Is it Johnny Gielli? <laughs> Johnny Gielli, yeah. Yeah, well, I should say the same thing as Jeff. You know, friendship and uh, lots of funny, great uh, road moments while touring with Hardline. Yeah. And uh, I gained I gained uh, a brother, you know, by making music with him. And, and Jeff uh, and Jeff is uh, sorry, uh, Johnny is 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 great to work with what a voice and and i owe him uh one of my best songs uh sang by one of the best voices which is take you home and still today when we play that song live and it's ah, it gives me chills every night and uh and i owe uh johnny the trust of trusting a you know like a you know, punk from Italy and, you know, and uh, starting to work on Hardline together and uh, making so, so many great records together and, you know, hitting stages. And uh, yeah, yeah, I cannot say but positive things. Yeah, and Johnny is incredible. Um, Tony Franklin. Wow. Well, uh, you know, Tony was one of the first ones that I worked with. Uh, was it 2005? that I sang on a record and he was playing bass and uh, in pace was playing drums and, uh, and, I, and I got a call to sing, to sing the song called silent hunter. Well, actually the song didn't have a melody and didn't have lyrics. So I wrote the lyric and I did the demo and they kept the demo vocals for the record. So uh, that's been, that's been, you know, great. And, and as a, as a blue murder fan, you know, I, I was like, Oh my God, you know, a, a 26 years old, me was like, oh, my God, Tony Franklin. You know, <laughs> I was thinking about the, you know, the Blue Murder bass riff. Do right. do, 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 do. And I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the first bands I was ever in, I I quit after a day because the singer was convinced that they were going to replicate they were going to they were going to recreate the blue murder sound and he's you need to play like tony you need to play like tony and i'm like dude nobody plays like tony yeah yeah, yeah just don't do it and he goes so, well all you yeah, gotta so do is just follow the notes and i'm like you can follow all the notes you want no no tony's unique but tony is tony there's a tone to what tony does that's you know it's like when you hear Duff McKagan. It's when you hear Slash. It's when you hear certain people. They have their own yeah, identifiable absolutely. tone that is Brian May. When you hear Brian May's guitar, you know it's Brian May. Nobody yeah, replicates nobody, that. Nobody, even if you try, it's impossible. Exactly. You know? And I was like, no matter what I do, I'm not going to play like Tony. He goes, well, I'll find somebody that does. And I was like, you know what? Good luck. <laughs> walked away because he, was, he, didn't find it. <laughs> he had it in his mind that was what he wanted and he was not going to take anything less and I knew even with my limited skill set because I'm a mediocre bass player at best nobody he found was going to replicate oh, what Tony man. Franklin does and I was See? like hey good luck bro I, mean, I, I wish you great success and I moved on to do my next thing, you know, but um, Tony's been one of them guys that I've always held up uh, up there as well, up there with Gary, as far as, you know, for what he does, such a unique and identifiable sound. That's and again, someone with a resume that's just completely untouchable, you know, of what he's done. Um, the last one, uh, this is a new artist. Uh, I've interviewed her and I'm friends with her dad and you uh, recently have worked with her and her new record is getting ready to come out soon. Um, Cassidy Paris. Paris. I knew. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, I've i been uh, chatting with uh, Steve for, which is uh, right. his, uh, Cassidy's dad, uh, for years. And then one day he wrote me and he was like, you you want to hear, you know, the new single of Cassidy and was uh, Danger, the song Danger. And I was mm -hmm. like, you know, Steve, I guess finally 
Cassidy has found what she's been doing. She mm-hmm. she should be doing. And uh, uh, and I said, let me talk to the label. And uh, and that's how she got on the label. And you know, and uh, I, I I really wanted to do something special for her. I didn't write any song for her. And uh, uh, because I wanted a certain sound that, uh, you know, I I knew that I had to get somebody else to do that. So she wrote, I guess, five or six songs on the record, mm-hmm. some with full name, but most on her own. But I was like, I think I should talk to Cliff Magnus to get that sound. I need those songs. And I and I wrote Cliff and I was like, you know, there's a there's a new girl on 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 the scene that I think she's gonna she's gonna really hit, you know, mm-hmm. this if I can get her the right songs. I, I tried to write the songs, but that's not my style of writing. Mm-hmm. I need something that comes from someone who's been who's done, you know, every Levine and you know, and all mm-hmm. these great songs for girls. Uh, and, uh, and he was like, oh yeah, could you send me a song? And I sent the song and he was like, yeah, here's, uh, he sent me, I think 15 songs. Nice. And I was like, oh my God. And they were somewhere <laughs> like fantastic. And, uh, and I wrote Cassidy and I was like, just talk to Cliff and he wants to be part of the record. And he sent me, you know, these songs and I picked the ones that I think are going to be perfect for you. Uh, for your persona, for your style and everything. And I'm so glad that she's doing, you know, I really think she's going to be, she's going to be doing a lot. You know, yeah. she's, she's got, she's young, but she's determined. And one thing that Steve on our first call uh, with Cassidy and Steve, Steve told me one thing. He said, I raised her as a hard worker. She's loyal. She's professional. She's young, yeah. but you will be impressed on the ethics that are yeah. in the right place and she's so professional so driven and i wish her the best you know and uh you know even as a producer i'm just you know i played bass also and keyboards on the record but i i didn't want to i didn't want to steal any little bit of, right. of online and i said uh cassidy that's your record and i really think we should do it the right way send me any song you have if we're missing something, I'm gonna go to the big guys. And I don't think she 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 thought that I could get to Cliff, but I wrote Cliff and I was like, you know, I know that Cliff has, you know, probably, you know, <laughs> an arsenal of songs in, in drawers. And uh it took like two weeks or something like that that he sent songs, and I was like, Oh my god, what <laughs> how can you be so good like Cliff? But uh, but I'm very very happy for for Cassidy. I think she's she's really onto something, you know. And I, yeah. and I I'll support her forever. Yeah, I love Cassidy. I I got to interview her and, and Steve together, and <laughs> and uh, she is such a sweetheart, and she's so genuine, and I love that she is as determined as she is, and she's yeah, but down to her. I mean, she's like down yeah. to her, very determined, and. You know, she's a dreamer, but she's a dreamer with, you know, ready to right. you know, roll the sleeves and get to work and 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 put the you know put the hard work in, which is something that you know 99% of the musicians don't want to do. Yeah. You know, she's ready to go. She was like, I'm I'm gonna play anywhere. You know, she's like, I don't care. I'm gonna play anywhere. And she's young, so she has she's in the right, right. time of her life to do that. And I said, Well, Cassidy, go. I'll just I'll just to work on the songs but then just go and bring the songs to anybody you know and i she, i think she will do, she will do she will do a lot absolutely so my last question is this dream collaboration i know you've worked with just a, a you know a laundry list of people that you that you adore and people that you like as musicians but if there was one person that you haven't collaborated with that's still around that you could who who is that like one person that you would love to do a record with you know besides everybody that i've worked with everybody that i talked to and didn't end up work with there's only one guy and it's paul mccartney if that ever happens yeah i could you know 
yeah, I could leave that would be incredible. Top <laughs> the day after. But uh, but you know, but but sometimes, you know, yeah, yeah, the dream is is Paul McCartney, but but sometimes you uh, you know, I I I I I'm like, you know, I really hope that one of these guys that I'm producing, like Cassidy or these newcomers, really make it so that right. one day I can say I can be proud of saying, well, I was, you know, at the beginning right. I was there. I could experience the talent and smell, you know, the success. Uh and uh yeah, but Paul McCartney would be the dream gig. It's funny. Um do you know who Jelly Roll is? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I've been friends with Jelly Roll for almost 25 years. I was, we were there in the very beginning when he was doing the trap hip hop. When he first got out of federal prison. I've been telling people since 2001, this kid's going to be huge. Oh, he's just a fat guy from Nashville. He just raps about drugs yeah. he just does this yeah. and he does this and everybody's like he's never and i was like dude it's not a question of if jelly is gonna blow up it's only a question of when sooner or later he's gonna do something the right person's gonna hear it and he's gonna be bigger than life he is one of the most genuine down-to-earth people you will ever meet kind to his just very core and I always knew that he was going to blow up. And when he started blowing up and all of these people were all of a sudden, oh, jelly this, jelly that. And I'm like, I'm telling you all since 2001. Yeah. One of the first people I ever played on my show is one of the first people I ever interviewed. You guys told me it was just some fat guy from Nashville. It was just some fat guy from Nashville. Well, the fat guy from Nashville is literally everywhere now. Yeah, and, and now it's like everywhere. <laughs> yeah, and I, I tell people like, look, I always do. So I, I, I get like, you know, that of that feeling of kind of wanting to be there. Um, I had no hand in his success, and I mean, I'll never claim to say that I did, but but know. it's good to see when you know when you can yeah. see, you no, know, the you know somebody flourish like that. You know, yeah, like, like you know, he, to come from. His background, literally being in federal prison for selling drugs, to be that guy who he was living in his van, he had nothing. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. It's so good to see to see somebody you know, get out of it. to to beat the odds, to shatter the glass ceiling, to prove that no matter how bad your life has been in the past, you can still do positive things and you absolutely, can, absolutely absolutely you know, um absolutely. and that's hey that's my message to everybody like i don't care where you come from you don't have to let that determine where you're going to go in the future absolutely because, not absolutely not. um uh so with that said uh this is mr alessandro de vecchio uh i am honored beyond words that you allowed me <laughs> the time to do this with you and thank you so much well, uh, I, I thank I thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk and to make a different kind of interview, and I it's great to see that we have the same musical taste. You know, rarely I can talk about uh, Steve Ackett and <laughs> Gary Moore and and uh, the Division Bell. I'm so happy that we made this interview. It's been a long time coming since we spoke about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'm very yeah. I'm very, was it was I'm the last record. record. It was the record before Ritual that we actually started talking about doing the interview. Uh, thank you very much for your time, for giving me your platform and your your oh, audience. Yeah. And uh, anytime, you know, anytime in the future, you know, you want to make an interview, I'll, I'll always be here. Yeah, and and I and I truly hope that uh, with the with the puppy that everything is, you know, going well and he's sure getting not. better and. That they can yeah it's uh it's a it. it's a hard time but you yeah. know it's um you know you you uh what i like about uh the downs you know is that you reevaluate yeah people around you life everything and uh and you know i i love life i love life in it's good and bad you know ups yeah. and downs dark and, and light 
and uh, good and evil. And, you know, it's um, it's a tough, it's definitely a tough year for me and my family, for my health, for, for the dog, for everything. Right. But, you know, but we're here kicking, you know, and uh, trying to, to get the best out of it every day. Awesome. Uh, as always, you know how we end. Be well. Treat each other with kindness. Remember, Absolutely. no matter what you're going through, music always heals.